is called Calvary, and that person is called Jesus. Mark chapter 16, beginning at verse number 1. The Bible says, Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices, that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said to themselves, Who will roll a stone away from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man, clothed in long white robes, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go and tell his disciples and Peter that he goes before you in Galilee. And there you will see him as he said to you. So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb. For they trembled and were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Today, for the next few moments, I want to share a message on the subject of Easter morning. You know, I can think about it, looking at the Scriptures, and the Bible tells us very early on in the Bible that one of these days God would send His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, from the portals of glory down to this earth. And the reason that Jesus had to come, we know. Because when you and I read in the book of Genesis, we find that God had placed man and woman in the garden. And the Bible says that they did what God said not to do. And when they did that, ladies and gentlemen, they plunged the whole entire human race into sin. And from that moment on, Jesus was to come one day as the Messiah and die on an old rugged cross. In fact, the Bible says that this was planned even from the beginning. The Bible says that from the, before the foundations of the world, Jesus Christ would come and die on an old rugged cross. We know throughout reading our Old Testament, time and time again, the Bible promised that one day a Messiah would come. Now when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, God had to kill an animal. Its blood had to be shed. And then the skin from that animal clothed them from their nakedness. But throughout the Old Testament, the Bible says that there was coming one day the Lamb of God that was spotless, without sin whatsoever. And one of these days, Jesus Christ because of the sins of mankind, would die on an old rugged cross, the spotless Lamb of God, and see in the Old Testament when the animals were killed and the blood was was spilt, the sins could only be covered. But one day God would send His Son, the Lord Jesus. And when Jesus died on the cross and shed His blood, sin would not only be covered, but the Bible says it would also be cleansed. It would be forgiven. What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So ladies and gentlemen, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, He died for the sins of mankind. Not to cover our sins, but to cleanse our sins and wash our sins away. You see, when you and I come to the New Testament, we find that indeed God sent His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, down to this earth. He stepped out of the portals of glory. He came down to this earth. He wrapped Himself in human flesh. He was born as a babe in Bethlehem. That we celebrate at Christmas. But that's not the end of the story. 
For 33 and a half years, Jesus walked upon this earth, and for three and a half years of his life, he did the ministry that the Father, God, had sent him to do. All the miracles that Jesus was able to perform, the sermons that Jesus was able to preach, the things that Jesus was able to do had never been seen before by no one. And now he comes to the end, to the close of his ministry on the earth. We find him in the Garden of Gethsemane. It is there that he is in agonizing prayer. He has brought some of his disciples, but he told them to stay just a little ways, and he went a little farther to pray. He told those disciples to be in prayer as well. But each time that Jesus checked back with them, he found them not praying but sleeping. And Jesus admonished them, could you not pray? By the way, ladies and gentlemen, if there's ever been a time that Jesus needed the disciples to pray, it was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus looked into that cup, that cup of wrath and judgment, that cup where God took all the sins of mankind and put them and placed them on the back of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he would climb up Golgotha's hill, up Calvary. And there he would die for the sins of mankind. But Jesus looked into that cup, and even though it was horrible, even though it was terrible, even though it was, it was intense, he prayed, Father, not my will, but thine be done. And it is indeed right that Jesus was willing to take that cup. He was willing to take the sins of the entire world upon Him. He was willing to take your sins and my sins upon Him. You see, ladies and gentlemen, when you see Jesus die on the cross, it is not because Jesus has done anything wrong. It is because we have done wrong. It is because of our sins that Jesus is going to that cross. And God would take all of the wrath, all of the judgment, all of the sins of the past, the present, and the future, and God would put them all on Jesus. We find Jesus next leaving the Garden of Gethsemane where he has been betrayed, where Judas had sold him for 30 pieces of silver for the mere price of a slave. We follow him as he is beaten, as he is maligned, as he is laughed and scoffed at, as he is spit upon, as they take a crown of thorns and press into his brow. And now they, after sending him to trial after trial, finding no fault in him, they take an old rugged cross and place it on his back. And Jesus carries that cross up Calvary's hill. The next place that we see is not a scene at Gethsemane, but now we see him at Calvary. And we see the Lord Jesus Christ lay himself down, stretch himself out, willingly to die on that old rugged cross. And the Bible says that they take that cross with Jesus on and they lift it up and drop it into a hole with a thud at the bottom. And now we see Jesus hanging there dying. After a while, he finally says, it is finished. And he gave up the spirit. And his lifeless body hung there on the cross. There were people that were standing there. There were women that were standing there. In fact, the women that we see in the text that we have just read, they were some of the last at the cross and some of the first at the tomb. They knew that Jesus had died. They knew that he had breathed his last. They knew that they had taken him down and they had put him in a borrowed tomb and they had to hurry to do that because the Sabbath was coming up. They knew that Jesus was dead. And that brings us to our scene in the scripture this morning. Now, defeated, bewildered, scared, their Savior had died. Jesus Christ was dead. 
and they did not have time to anoint the body and do the proper uh, burial for Jesus that afternoon. And so the next morning, early in the morning, just like some of us gathered on the front lawn of the church for our sunrise service this morning, early that morning, these women begin to make their way with some special spices to anoint the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they're making their way and all of a sudden we begin to hear in these verses of Scripture some of the conversation that was taking place. Who is going to roll away the stone? I mean, we bought the spices. We've got everything to do the job with, but we forgot something. We should have got somebody with strong muscles to come with us. Somebody should have come to roll that stone away. How are we going to get in? What are we going to do? Hey, Mary, did you think about that? I didn't think about it. And I'll tell you what, my mind is so bewildered. My heart is so heavy. I didn't even think about it. Finally, they turn to the last bend. And when they look up, behold, something had happened that they never imagined. The Bible says that the stone had been rolled away. I like what the old country preacher one time said. He said that the stone was rolled in that way, not for Jesus to get out, but for them to look in. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus could have spoke a word and demolished that stone. He could have obliterated it in, in thousands of pieces, pieces and, and yet he didn't. The Bible says the stone was rolled away and they look. And the Bible says as they get closer and closer, they finally get up to the tomb and they step inside of the tomb. And they look where the body of Jesus was laying and behold, there was no body there. But there was somebody there. The Bible says in the corner sitting on a ledge there was a man. In fact, it was an angel. And that angel said, have you come seeking Jesus of Nazareth? I'm sorry, he's not here. He's alive. He has risen. And to their utter surprise, the stone was rolled away. Jesus' body was gone because he was alive and alive forevermore. There are three things that I believe that we can learn from this story this morning. First of all, I want you to see this morning the miracle of Easter. As we think about Easter morning, I want you to think about the miracle of Easter. Since these ladies arrived, the first ones to get to the tomb. They discover that it was unoccupied. Once where the lifeless body of the Lord Jesus Christ was laying, now it was empty. You see, the miracle of the empty tomb is not uh, uh, really that, that the tomb is empty, but the tomb points to somebody who rose from the dead. It was a miracle that there was an empty tomb, but it was a greater miracle that God raised His Son back to life. You see, the empty tomb is a sign that points to really the true miracle of Easter. The miracle of Easter is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I don't know what you think about the resurrection, but I believe that Jesus bodily rose from the dead. And because Jesus vitally rose from the dead, did you know that one of these days, if we're in a grave somewhere, when Jesus comes back again, we're coming back with Him, our spirit and soul, we will go back into that grave, we will be wrapped with a brand new immortalized body, and we too, just like Jesus, will vitally resurrect out of the grave. You see, there ain't no grave going to hold my body down. And Jesus got out of that grave. He bodily resurrected. You see, there's really no miracle in an empty tomb. Anybody can empty a tomb. In fact, there were some people that were paid to say that the body of Jesus had been stolen away. Anybody can empty a tomb, but not everybody can resurrect a body from the dead. Ladies and gentlemen, God did that in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
The tomb is simply a sign that Jesus has risen from the dead. But there's something else about this miracle of Easter. Not only is, is this resurrection a, a sign, but the empty tomb is a symbol of the miracle of the resurrected Christ. You see, it isn't the empty tomb that produces faith. I tell you, before I ever had the privilege to go and see the empty tomb, I already had faith. My wife and I have had the privilege twice to be able to go to Israel, to be able to go to that tomb where they believed that Jesus was laying. I cannot tell you the feeling that comes over you when you walk into that tomb and you look over and you see that slat of marble that's been hewn out of the rock. And you look there where they believe that the body of Jesus might have been laid and you see, guess what? It's empty. There's no body. There's no bones. There's nothing whatsoever. And I cannot tell you how much it blessed me to be able to stand there and be in the tomb where Jesus rose from the dead. But ladies and gentlemen, my faith, in Christ didn't begin there I want to tell you that I believe before I ever got there it's not the tomb that gave me the faith it was Jesus and his resurrection that gave me the faith now the empty tomb is a powerful symbol of what happened that first Easter morning so early in the morning the Bible says these women Mary Magdalene Mary the mother of James and Salome are bringing spices to anoint the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. But when they arrive, there's a surprise. The stone had been rolled away. There was no body to anoint. There is no body to see. There is no body to touch. There is no body to prepare. Jesus had rose from the dead. He was alive forevermore. I can't imagine what it would be like to be an undertaker and to go pick up a dead body and to take it to the funeral home and to roll it into the preparation room. Let's say you were to roll it in there and shut the door and about three days later you come back to begin preparing that body. And you look in there and there's nobody there. I want to tell you ladies and gentlemen, that's a good time to exit the building, hello. Hello. Now, my mama always told me that the dead can't hurt you, but they can sure make you hurt yourself. <laughs> I've always told you that I have a brave heart when I get scared, but my feet just won't stand still. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you that these ladies had the surprise of their life. It was a miracle. Jesus had rose from the dead. But not only do we see the miracle of Easter, but secondly, there was a message of Easter. You see, the Bible says when these women arrive at the tomb, it was not altogether empty. When they entered the tomb, they saw a man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side. And the Bible says that they, would be, they were afraid. I would be afraid too. In fact, if I went into a mausoleum, and I went to visit the grave of someone and there was nobody there, I'm going to tell you right now, I'd be making me a new door. I'd be getting out of there real fast. And, and the angel is aware of why they're there. They have come to anoint the body of Jesus of Nazareth who had been crucified. But the angel said, I'm sorry, he's not here. You're looking at the wrong place. In another passage, the Bible says, that they were told, why seek you the living among the dead? So the angel of the Lord gives them a message that first Easter. First of all, he offers them a word of faith. He said unto them, he's risen, he is not here. Ladies and gentlemen, the phrase he is risen goes to the very core of our Christianity. He is risen. He is alive. And thank God this morning we didn't come to mourn a dead God. By the way, the only thing that I know to do with a dead God is bury it quickly before it stinks. 
No, we have come to celebrate a living, resurrected Christ. They did not come expecting to find Him risen. They came to anoint His body. And no doubt their faith had been shaken to the core. I mean, their Savior, their friend, Jesus Christ, they saw Him being put on the cross. They saw Him die on the cross. They saw them take Him down. They saw Him being put in a borrowed tomb. But the angel said that morning, He's not here. He is risen. Ladies and gentlemen, in a world filled with skepticism and cynicism in this world in which you and I live, if there's ever been a refreshing word that we need, it is that He is risen. He is alive. That angel gave them a message of faith. But he also gave them a message of forgiveness. In verse 7, look at what that verse says. It says, but go tell his disciples and Peter that he goes before you in Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. That's a word of forgiveness for all of those disciples. You say, well, what's so significant about that? Well, ladies and gentlemen, all of them had forsaken the Lord Jesus Christ. In a time when Jesus needed them the most, they forsook him. And not only did Peter forsake him, but the Bible says Peter denied him. And this man said, go tell the disciples and Peter that he will go before you in Galilee as he said. Ladies and gentlemen, I can't imagine how miserable Peter must have felt as he had failed the Lord Jesus Christ. Yet Jesus wanted Peter to know that he could be forgiven. Go tell the disciples and if they were from southern Jerusalem, where Mark seems to think some of them were from, then he would have said, hey, and y'all tell Peter too. Make sure you tell Peter because I'm sure that Peter is overwhelmed with guilt. He had deserted the Lord. He had denied the Lord. And tell Peter that I'm coming to see him. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus refused to rebuke those disciples. Jesus refused to forsake those disciples. They might have done that to him, but he was not going to do that to them. Aren't you glad that he doesn't treat us like we treat him? Aren't you glad that in our hour of need, in our times of trouble, that the Lord Jesus Christ comes to us and he helps us? And He's there for us through the thick and thin, whether we're on the mountaintop or whether we're in the valley. Jesus is always there. And Jesus refuses to forsake those disciples. In these words are reconciliation. In these words are forgiveness. I don't know of a better word that we need in our society today than that Jesus can forgive. We live in a hostile world. We live in a world of hate. We live in a world of envy. We live in a world of strife. We live in a world of sin. But aren't you glad that Jesus Christ is willing to forgive us? Aren't you willing that He is willing to reach down in the sinking sand of this world and pick us up off of the sand and put our feet on a solid rock and establish our going? Aren't you glad, thank God, that He forgives our sins? I tell you, we would be on our way to hell this morning had it not been for the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that there is none good, no, not one. All we like sheep have gone astray. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It was a message of faith. It was a message of forgiveness. Thirdly, it was a message of hope. Thank God there's hope in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. This day is all about life. This day is all about renewal. This day is all about forgiveness, hope, and faith. 
hope. Folks, if there was anything the disciples needed, it was a word of hope. It was a word of encouragement. It was a word of forgiveness. And Jesus comes to them offering it to them. The angel said, go tell his disciples and Peter that he goes before you in Galilee. What does that mean? That means, ladies and gentlemen, there's hope in the presence of the Lord. Amen? We can't go anywhere. He's not already been and already present. Thank God He was there yesterday. He's here today and He will be here tomorrow. Jesus had led the way to Jerusalem and Jerusalem was a place of suffering and death but now, thank God, Jesus leads the way to victory. And He overcame the grave, death, hell and the grave. Friend, it was in Galilee. He said, tell them, I go before them in Galilee. Galilee. Oh, what memories there were in Galilee. You see, ladies and gentlemen, Galilee is remembered of a place of power and new beginnings. In Galilee, it was there that Jesus performed some of His greatest miracles. It was in Galilee that the disciples were appointed to preach and cast out demons. Galilee represents a place of new beginnings, new hope, and a new start even after their failures. Can I just tell you this morning that Jesus can do that for every one of us as well? We may have failed. I'm sure we have. We missed the mark many times. But I'm grateful this morning that we can find hope and forgiveness in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. It means hope in His presence. It also means hope in His promise. I can't imagine that the dreams of these disciples had been dashed. Their dreams of ruling and reigning with Him had been dashed after His death. But then it says, Tell them I come before them in Galilee as I told them. Can I just tell you ladies and gentlemen, When the Bible says something, you can mark it down. When God makes a promise, you can take it to the bank. Anything that God promises to do, He can always, all the time, back it up. And the angel reminds them of the promise that he had told them before he died that he would go before them in Galilee. Someone said of the promises of Jesus, When Jesus makes a statement, it's a gentleman who never takes back his word. He always comes through. Folks, all we got to do is believe. All we've got to do is accept and trust what the Lord has already said. The message of Easter is a message of hope. It's a message of forgiveness. It's a message of faith. Ladies and gentlemen, our world needs that message today. Some of you here this morning may need that message today. You need hope. You need forgiveness. You need faith in the right things in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you this morning that Jesus can give you all of those things. Not only do we see the the miracle of Easter and the message of Easter, but finally we see the mission of Easter. You see, these ladies were told to do something. In verse number 7, the angel said, Go and tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you in Galilee, and there you will see him as he said to you. Now, if you and I were just to stop here, it would be an untold story. The first question in my mind would be, Hey, preacher, did they ever tell him? And believe it or not, if you read some of the other Gospels, you will find out that yes, they went back and told them and some of them came to check for themselves as well. The angel said, go tell. And these women carried the greatest message of all times. They were the first to share the greatest message of all times that Jesus is alive, that Jesus is not dead, 
that Jesus has risen. And you know what we're to do? Ladies and gentlemen, as Christian people, we're to carry that same message today. I've had the privilege to preach on two continents other than ours. Had the privilege to preach in Jerusalem. Can tell you what a tremendous privilege that was to, to preach and go back and preach a revival in South Africa. And then to carry the message to many of the states across our nation. And you say, well, preacher, I, I don't know if I could go to Jerusalem and carry the message, and I don't know if I could go to South Africa. That's okay. Maybe God's not calling you to go to Jerusalem or go to South Africa. That's all right. Now, if He's called you, you need to get on the next plane out. But you don't have to go there to another continent. Man, you can go to your neighbor. You can tell your family members and friends. You can tell folks down the street. You can tell folks that you interact with and come in contact with. Hey, you can tell people around the water cooler at work of what Jesus did. I imagine next week that there's going to be people asking you, what did you do for Easter? And you can say, well, I went to the house of God. And I heard the message, the greatest message of all about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then you can just simply tell them what Jesus did for you and what He can do for them. Because ladies and gentlemen, He didn't die yesterday. He didn't die today. He's alive. He's alive forevermore. And Jesus Christ changed our life. He's changing lives every day. And He can change their life as well. Just tell them what the risen Savior has done for you and what He can do for them. You say, well, I don't know if they'll listen. It's okay. That's not your responsibility to make them listen. You just tell them. You say, well, I don't know if they'll accept Christ. That's okay. That's their choice, not yours. You can't make people be saved. Our responsibility is not for us to save them. That's God's business. Our business is to share the gospel message. Our business is to do as this angel told these women, go and tell the disciples the greatest news of all. Share with them the greatest message of all times. And ladies and gentlemen, we just might be the person that plants the seed. Somebody else might come along and water it. And God is the one that always gives the life and gives the increase. Last Friday and yesterday, some of our youth and some of the other folks in the church planted a little community garden back here behind the church. And they put the seed in. And they watered it. But you know only God can germinate that seed? Only God can bring life to that seed? Only God can perform under that dirt that was covered up with that just that little old seed. Only God can perform the miracle of that seed coming to life and bursting forth through that ground and coming up and looking to the sunshine. You see, our business is to be faithful planting the seed. Somebody else will come along one day and water it. And then God will give the increase. Some of you teach these children around here and you wonder if they're ever listening. I can't tell you how many testimonies I've heard of adult people who say, I remember so-and-so was my Sunday school teacher. You didn't think they were listening? You didn't think they heard a word you said? You never know how that seed lava will be planted in that little heart. And one day they speak and say, you know, so-and-so taught me Sunday school when I was a child and that's when I heard the gospel message that was put in my heart. And years later, ladies and gentlemen, somebody came along and watered that and then God brought life to that seed. Oh, I trust this morning that there'll be a lot of people who go out of this building sharing with your friends and neighbors and families the message of Easter. He is risen. He's not here. He's alive. 
see the place where they laid him. Friend, I've been there. I've peered in the tomb. I've looked at the marble slab. And I'm telling you this morning, by a first hand, he is not there. Jesus is alive. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now let's go tell the world that Jesus is alive.